I am delighted to introduce our third panel of the scientific program. And this panel, Lessons from Compounding Health Crises, The Future is Now, will be moderated by Alan Weil. Alan is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading health policy journal. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and recently completed a term as an appointed member of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, MACPAC. He is a trustee of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C., and directs the Aspen Institute's Health Strategy Group. He was the executive director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, directed the Urban Institute's Assessing the New Federalism Project, held a cabinet position as executive director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, the state's Medicaid agency, and was assistant general counsel in the Massachusetts Department of Medical Security. Weil earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's degree from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a JD from Harvard Law School. So over to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Sue. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate today's panel. Now, if you were with us this morning, you heard panels focused on two complex multifaceted policy topics, COVID-19 and climate change. In this session, we're gonna build on those topics looking more broadly at this notion of compounding health crises, of which unfortunately there are quite a few. When I think about what we publish in health affairs, I'm struck by how many challenges we face, how multidimensional they are, but I'm also struck by the commonalities across them with respect to some of the issues they raise and the approaches required to address them. In this session, I'm hoping to keep focused on those commonalities so we're not overwhelmed by the detail. So if I look back at the journal, for example, back in February of this year, we published a series of papers from the National Academy of Medicine called Vital Directions, looking at future policy needs for the country. What were some of the topics in those Vital Directions papers? There was infectious disease threats, uh, which also looked at the topic of antimicrobial resistance. There was a focus on optimizing health and well-being for women and children, one for actualizing better health and health care for older adults. All of these are multidimensional, they're complex, and they're problems that will grow in the future, particularly if we don't try to tackle them now. Or I could open up the October issue, the one we just published a couple of weeks ago, which was focused entirely on perinatal mental health, or think about the broader topic of maternal mortality. Uh, these are complex topics uh, that require multidimensional solutions. When I think about what are the themes behind not just COVID and climate, but some of the other topics I've raised, a half dozen of them come to mind and I'll toss them out to get us started. And then you'll hear much more detail from our panelists. Um, first of all, none of these are just pure health policy topics. They bring in what some have called social determinants of health. They bring in social policy, economic policy, environmental policy. You can't solve any of these problems focusing exclusively on health policy. They all have intergovernmental aspects. They require federal, state, and local approaches, and many of them require global health institutions to make progress as well. They have uh, an interplay between clinical medicine and health policy. We need research, we need innovation, we need clinical solutions, but we also have to address the context in which those uh, investments or research findings or clinical practices occur if we're going to really make the progress we need. They're all highly inequitable in the burdens that they impose. Even as we try to solve a problem, we run the risk of addressing and moving up the average while we increase the distribution between those who do best and those who do worst. That's not a solution at all. We need to focus on solutions that simultaneously improve and narrow the gaps that we have. They all have complex time horizons. Uh, they may seem immediate or they may seem quite distant, but they change over time in our ability to assess risk and risk and how it, uh, and challenges how they change over time is something that our, our brains aren't particularly good at. And we have to figure out how to look at complex time horizons if we're going to tackle these. And they all need to build their solutions from local diagnoses, local solutions, local strengths, local voices, up to state, national, global, or else we're just going to uh, continue to uh, adopt uh, sort of top-down approaches that 
uh, have historically proven themselves uh, not particularly effective, particularly when it comes to the social aspects of these kinds of topics. So uh, I'm not going to tell you that at the end of our 75 minutes, we're going to have solved the multidimensional complex emerging issues that our country faces, but hopefully you'll have some insight from practical experience from our panelists about approaches that make it more likely that we will succeed as we address them. Uh, in that, uh, in this time, you're going to hear from four panelists. I'll go ahead and give you the introductions of them all at the outset, and then they can uh, speak in turn. You'll hear from Ana diaz Ru, who's the Dana and David Dornsife Dean and Distinguished University Professor of Epidemiology at Drexel University School of Public Health. You'll hear from Emily Brunson, Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Texas State University. Ed Maybach is next. He's a university professor at George Mason University and the director of the George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication. And Umer Shah, who's the Washington State Secretary of Health, former executive director and local health authority for Harris County Public Health, so state and local public health experience. Um, each of them will speak to their experience and their approach, and then we'll have some time for questions, including those that come in from the audience. I'll turn it over first uh, to you, Anna. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. This has been a wonderful seminar. I really enjoyed the uh, previous two panels. Um, I look forward to the conversation in this one. So I've organized my remarks um, on the uh, lessons from compounding health crisis in, into uh, five key points that I'd like to make, five key lessons that I perceive that uh, we can learn from both of these crises that we are facing. Um, the first uh, is the value and indeed the need for a population and a systems perspective, um, both in understanding these crises and also in figuring out what we should do about them. <laughs> Um, and this is, of course, very obvious, has been made very obvious by COVID because it is an infectious disease. And of course, the dynamics of systems are critical to understanding disease transmission and the evolution of a pandemic. Um, but it, the systems thinking and the, 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 the systems approach is also critically important in the case of the climate crisis, where we see dynamics that have to do, for example, with overconsumption by some causing exposures in others, or in the concept of co-benefits, for example, that Michelle Bell was talking about earlier, where uh, good environmental policy has health co-benefits, uh, where things like reducing automobile transportation, reducing consumption of processed foods simultaneously have reinforcing environmental and health benefits. And we can only understand that if we think systemically. And this means that in many ways, we need to rethink the ways in which we do science and train junior scientists so that they can draw from interdisciplinarity and from multiple methods that we need in order to really understand the functioning of these systems and what we can do effectively to nudge them in a direction that is health promoting and that protects our planet. A second lesson, um, I think, which has come across very clearly in the presentations that we heard today, has to do with the critical role of pre-existing inequities uh, in these in, in understanding the full impacts of these crises and also in acting to prevent their adverse health impacts. And of course, these inequities, as we have heard today, are driven by structural and systemic factors that have to do with racism, with inequalities inherent in our economic system, um, and have been very clearly illustrated with COVID and also are being clearly illustrated uh, in terms of the health impacts of climate change, um, as we heard in the panel earlier today, also in terms of who's exposed, how that, how pre-existing social and economic inequities uh, uh, and racism interact with exposures and ability of populations to adapt, et cetera. And so these dimensions, critical dimensions for inequality include, of course, race, income, 
neighborhoods also work, and I particularly want to call out work because I think COVID in particular has highlighted the role of work conditions and the work environment in health, which is sometimes something that we often don't, uh, don't give enough importance to. And of course, understanding that the critical role of pre-existing inequities in, 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 in these, both of these crises is, is, is uh, very important in terms of understanding what we should be doing, but also understanding the potential implications of what we do. So ensuring that the, that the strategies, that the policies that we put in place to deal, for example, with climate change don't have uh, the consequence of increasing inequities. And I think this is something that was mentioned earlier today by Marshall Sh uh, Shepard uh, and, and necessitates by definition, if we're going to um, understand the full impact of inequities and grapple with them, we need to go outside of the biomedical world, obviously, um, and bring in other disciplines, other actors, et cetera. The third lesson um, has to do with recognizing and grappling with and taking seriously the interrelated nature of mental and physical health. Uh, we have seen this clearly illustrated with COVID, with the consequences of natural disasters. Um, and so thinking about um, how we simultaneously uh, address mental and physical health consequences and how they reinforce each other is also important. A fourth lesson uh, has to do with, um, with the role of science. And um, there are multiple dimensions to this. So I'm gonna spend just a, 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 a little bit more time on this, but uh, first, of course, and this builds on the first lesson about systems and um, systems uh, approaches, thinking systemically, um, uh, is the need for a science that is interdisciplinary, that relies on multiple methods, as I was saying, but that also includes scientists from diverse backgrounds who can bring different perspectives, different lived experiences to change the questions that we ask, challenge the conclusions that we draw, and help us think differently about the implications and the actions that are possible and necessary. A second element of in terms of the lessons for the role of science, uh, which also came out today quite a bit, I think, has to do with um, the need for an infrastructure and systems for collaborative science that allow us to respond effectively to these global challenges. And I think we have seen illustrated with COVID that even in the United States, the country possibly with the premier health and public health research infrastructure of the world, we um, face many, many challenges in responding uh, in a way that allowed us to draw scientific conclusions quickly, even about what was happening, why it was happening, and what we could do about it. And so I think this you know, generating evidence, quick, the, the, the kind of evidence that we need to be able to act quickly and in a coordinated fashion. And, and so I think thinking about how we can create data systems, networks, flexible platforms, collaborations that allow us to really um, bring together all the expertise that we have uh, is, is really important because I think the clearly the system that we have with individual investigators, individual institutions competing with each other um, did not serve us well in responding quickly to COVID, at least in my view. Another element of the role of science, I think, that has emerged has to do with how science interfaces with policy and what is the connection between, or should be the connection between science and policy. Of course, science can help us identify technological solutions. Of course, science can help us evaluate the effects of treatments or policies. And those things are very important and, um, and we need to do them better. And uh, as, as, as has been mentioned today as well, but I wanna highlight a couple of two other contributions of science, which I think in my view really emerged during COVID and are also important to the climate crisis. One has to do with the value of a precise and accurate description. 
And why? Because I think science has the power to make visible what is hidden. And I think that is a, a very important um, role of science that we sometimes forget about. And the other element has to do uh, with uh, science influencing policy through what Carol Weiss, who is also a sociologist, who has a really nice article from many years ago about the interface between science and social policy, she calls it the enlightenment role of science, which is really about science creating narratives and stories, causal stories, true causal stories about why things happen, um, about the causes, and that has immediate implications for what we should do about it. And I think this sort of causal framing um, is really important, particularly for, such, for big problems like climate and pandemics, where the policy implications are not simple, they are complex, and they probably involve big systems changes. And so for this, creating, changing the paradigm, changing the way in which the public perceives causes and what we as a society should be doing falls under the enlightenment you know, role of science for policy, which I think is really, really important. And sometimes in our efforts to be very focused and provide scientific evidence for a particular policy, which may be very important, we forget about this big picture framing role of science, which in my view, is probably the most significant way in which science can influence what we do as a society. So Anna, I'm gonna bring the uh, other speakers in so that we can have a conversation here. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up is uh, Emily Brunson. Emily, over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. Um, picking up where, where Anna was, was leading to, um, addressing global issues, especially global issues that are multifaceted, like COVID-19, like climate change, it, it requires a particular approach that science itself, we, we need to broaden, as Dr. Eric Landry was talking earlier, and, and to think about greater having greater diversity at the table. Um, this is diversity in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, age, country of origin, but it's also looking at having multi di multiple disciplines at the table. Um, as an anthropologist who often works in the, the public health and medical sphere, I often come at, at looking at these issues um, from a different perspective. And today I'm going to be highlighting work that I've been doing with Communivax, um, which is a, a national coalition of social scientists, public health experts, vaccine experts, and community advocates. And, and we've been working for the past year to bring together um, to broaden COVID-19 vaccination coverage within Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC communities, and also to strengthen the control these communities have over the trajectories of their own health and wellness moving forward. So why is this important? The, the technology development of vaccines was an amazing scientific accomplishment. Um, but unless people are willing to take those vaccines, the technology means nothing. So how do we, where do we go from here? What do we do when we're involving complex questions and, and issues and there are people involved? Um, I'd like to share three um, particular insights from my own work that, that are cross-cutting. They definitely apply to vaccination uptake, um, but they, they also apply to other issues like climate change. So the first point that I'd like to make is that messaging alone is, is not enough. Um, there's been a, a big focus on messaging, particularly with the vaccination campaign. And the underlying assumption of this is that the right information or the right messenger um, is the answer. It's, it's a nice approach. Um, it, it's simple and straightforward, but unfortunately the reality is more complex. Let me give you a few examples of this. So early on in the vaccine rollout, the Maryland governor claimed that black persons living in Prince George's County were refusing vaccination. Um, this had consequences within those communities, how they were perceived, their own trust in, in their government and in, in this public health measure. But the reality was is that black people in this particular area were not refusing vaccines. What was going on is the vaccines were being used and, and the vaccine appointments were being taken up 
by wealthy white people from neighboring counties who were able to navigate the online registration system, travel to the vaccination sites in Prince George's County, and then wait in line for hours um, to be able to get vaccines. So the issue was displacement. It, it wasn't hesitancy or resistance. Um, in all of our sites that, that we worked in, and we worked in seven sites across the US, um, respondents also reported access issues. Uh, they, they understood about vaccines. They wanted to get vaccines. They knew where the vaccine clinics would be and when they were open, but they didn't have money um, to be able to travel to vaccination sites or there, there was no mass transportation in rural areas. So they were unable to go. Um, some people had jobs and there were vaccination sites that were opening during the weekday or on weekends when they had to be at work. Um, or they, they lacked access to childcare or elder care to be able to go themselves without dragging you know, children and, and elderly parents who didn't travel well to the vaccination sites as well. Or they had limited or no internet access to make online vaccination appointments. And so addressing access issues and, and recognizing those are present goes beyond messaging. Um, relatedly, trust um, was an issue that came up. In Idaho, for example, our team found that the uptake of vaccination within the Hispanic community um, was particularly low. What was going on is that there were ID checks at vaccination sites. Um, they weren't necessary. It was just something that, that they had decided to do, and, and this had gotten out within the community. And the situation felt unsafe for migrants, um, for members of the community who had um, people here illegally in the US that were members of their family, and sometimes even citizens who just wanted to avoid scrutiny over their citizenship. And so what had to happen is this, this way of providing vaccines had to change. And, and there also had to be an advertising campaign that, that went out and explained that, that ID checks would not happen. And that made things um, more comfortable and, and allowed vaccine uptake to occur in that area. In other sites, including our sites in Alabama, Prince George's County in Maryland and Virginia, Tuskegee was often referenced by black community members. Um, this was really a metonym for mistreatment by the medical system. In Prince George's County, one of the respondents said, you know, why are you, speaking of the healthcare system, so concerned with us now? Where were you when we needed help with type two diabetes, with heart disease and access to care? And so their response then to you need to get vaccination was also to, to quote respondents in that area was hell no. You, you don't have our best interests at heart. And, and these issues of trust are also, they're more complex than a simple messaging campaign um, can address. Finally, in relation to this, the, the concerns that we found varied significantly from person to person. Um, and also they changed over time. So you could have a message that, that really worked at the beginning of the vaccination campaign that did not work three months later. Um, a case in point, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine pause, for example, caused some vaccinated participants to actually become hesitant and unhappy that they had received that vaccine. Um, and they were suggesting that they would, they plan to refuse booster doses in the future. And, and so this has, there's a different messaging and you need to be able to, to move with where the community is moving. So what we found um, that in addition to messaging, um, needs to happen. And for my second point is that community level or hyper-local hyper engagement is critical. So it's very essential to understand what's going on locally, um, including access difficulties, lacks of trust, and, and where that's coming from, um, concerns that they might have that are specific to the vaccine, to the disease, to the healthcare system, and, and how to address all of these. Um, as I said, in Idaho, making material in Spanish, um, clarifying the ID issue was the way to address that particular access issue. In Prince George's County, um, locally, our Communivax team has worked on taking shots to the shops. So they've been working with barbers and hairstylists um, as community healthcare workers to both address local issues um, from a trusted standpoint, but then having these personal one-on-one -on -one conversations, being able to offer vaccines in locations that, that people could go to, that they go to regularly. Um, this type of approach by having things be at community level or hyper-local, it's not an easy lift, but um, it is necessary and especially necessary to chip away at that quote, hell no wall. Um, finally, the other message that, that we found 
um, that I'd like to apply to this issue and, and other global issues like climate change is that the, the funding and, and continuous funding is necessary. Part of the reason that the vaccine rollout did not go as planned is because the appropriate community and public health resources were not in place at the beginning of the pandemic. There was a lack of community and public health workers and particularly and problematically little or no prior engagement with minority communities. Hence the, the question from our respondents in Prince George's County, why do you care about us now? Because you haven't up till now. Um, so in order to sustain the gains made and to continue and to move forward in a better way, we need to figure out how we can have consistent funding for these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Ed. Thank you, Alan. And I had actually set up, I've been thinking a lot lately about the similarities and differences between the, the COVID pandemic and climate change and the challenges they, they pose to us as health professionals. I'm going to skip over all of that. I've decided to just dive right in and build on uh, Emily's really wonderful comments. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to start by acknowledging the obvious, which is we are living through a culture war in America. Um, a lot of other countries are having culture wars too. I think ours is particularly pronounced. I actually think there may be multiple co culture wars going on simultaneously in the US. And one of the victims of, of the culture war, unfortunately, is, is evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based um, understanding of the issues because other, in a culture war, other priorities take precedence. Um, identity, I'll just say identity is the most fundamental of those. So that the fact, you know, our, our societal response to climate change has been enormously complicated by the culture wars. Our uh, response obviously to the COVID pandemic has been enormously complicated by the culture wars. But just because we are living in interesting times, as they say, doesn't mean we can uh, afford to um, ignore the fundamentals of how we know um, what we know are the attributes of, of effectively engaging to advance public health. Um, I would contend, sort of to build on Emily's comments, I would contend that, the, um, that we have 50 years of evidence supporting the fact that public health communication campaigns that succeed, and in fact, all public communication campaigns that succeed feature simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices. And each of those three elements are incredibly important. Simple, clear messages, uh, the message repetition, the trusted voices. Emily has already started to, to build on some of those, uh, flesh out some of those themes. Um, and I would contend that we haven't necessarily, the culture war has made it very difficult for us to um, come together behind simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices on both of these public health challenges. I would also contend that the non-scientific voices, the voices that want to hold sway it, with regard to public opinion, they're actually doing a better job. They've got simpler messages. They've got much more message repetition and they are mobilizing the trusted voices. And keep in mind, as Emily pointed out, trust is a entirely context dependent, like who I trust may be different than who you trust. Um, and so who the, the trusted voices will typically win the day. They might not necessarily be science-based trusted voices. Um, to build on Emily's next point is that that's, that's the evidence-based approach to sharing what we know. In the COVID pandemic, what we knew evolved rapidly, right? What we, what we know about climate change, it's a pretty mature science. It evolves slowly, not rapidly. Most of what we talk about today is pretty well understood. The same was not true during the pandemic. That was rapidly emerging, evolving science. Um, but once we've done the best job we can of sharing what we know so that people understand what's going on, and as Anna said, you know, the value of, of one value of, of science is the ability to offer a good, precise, accurate description of what's going on. And, and I agree with you entirely. I think that is one of the most fundamental, uh, fundamentally important roles that science plays in society. But once we do that, if there are actions that people should be taking, to protect themselves, to protect their family members, to protect other members of their community. We know that there are actions that we, the people who control the resources can take that makes it 
um, more likely that people will take those actions. Um, I like to simplify that with the following heuristic. People are, we, we should stop trying to change people, which is often what we try to use our public health response to do, changing people. We should put more of our effort on changing the actions that we're recommending to make those actions easier, more fun, and more popular. I'd like to speak to just unpack each of those three just momentarily. By easier, I mean to build on Emily's points, the things that we recommend people to do aren't necessarily easy. They have, there are all kinds of barriers that stop that make it difficult for people or governments or other institutions to take those actions. If we can use our resources to understand those barriers and to try to reduce those barriers, it becomes more likely that, that individuals or other decision makers will move forward in embracing the recommendations that, that we put forward. Fun has to do with the notion of benefits. Um, we, in public health, we may have a certain set of benefits that, that are our motivation for making those recommendations. They are public health benefits, public health and well being benefits, but those might not be the most compelling benefits to the decision makers that we're trying to reach out to and encourage them to take a different action. It helps when we bring in more of an anthropologic perspective to understand what benefits are most important to them. And one of those benefits comes, frankly, I think comes directly back to how we do better in operating in an environment characterized by a culture war. Respect. Respect is a really important benefit that everybody values. Um, and when we don't demonstrate that value, we don't tend to get very far. Um, and then finally, how do we make things popular that aren't necessarily popular already? I actually feel like we've done a pretty darn good job in, the, uh, in responding to the COVID pandemic of making a behavior that was, that was completely non-normative, mask wearing, much more normative in a short period of time and making a behavior that has become unfortunately societally contested and that is vaccinating uh, ourselves and our children. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job of making that popular. But one, there are whole, so, social science teaches us there are a whole bag of tricks, if you will, a whole set of strategies that will help us move from non-normative behaviors to, to cultivate them and make them more not normative until such time that they become truly normative, at which point their own, um, uh, their, their own uh, momentum carries, carries us along. Um, so let me come back to one final thought. Um, again, building off the notion of, of the way we share what we know is simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices. A, a former PhD student of mine and colleague and dear friend, J.T. Thacker uh, at Mazzy University in, in New Zealand, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, he added something to what I call my evidence-based uh, formula for effective public communication. And he added the notion of uh, simple, clear messages repeated often with compassion and kindness by a variety of trusted voices. I think that compassion and kindness is an incredibly important precondition for effectively sharing what we know and, and getting helping other people uh, consider whether or not what we are sharing with them has relevance. When we don't bring that, when we don't put our compassion and kindness forward, when we tend to give um, more of a uh, when we tend to be disrespecting in any way, shape, or form, and there's so many ways in which we can be disrespectful, people tune us out. That's what clicks in their identity-based processing as opposed to their evidence-based processing. So with regard to both COVID and climate change, the area in which I'm spending a lot more of my time thinking and uh, trying to operate is by finding ways to, to make sure that the compassion and kindness response is integral with our, our efforts to share what we know based on evidence. Thank you, Ed. And now I'll turn it over to you, Omer. Well, thank you. Uh, this is always the challenge when you're the last uh, speaker on an incredible panel. So uh, Anna, Emily, and Ed, thank you so much for your comments, your remarks. And you know, I, I'm gonna try not to be duplicative and hopefully add to what was mentioned. Um, Alan, um, just to give a little bit of background to everybody, uh, 
as you mentioned in the introduction, I am now the Secretary of Health in the great state of Washington. And I come here now after 25 years of being in Texas and particularly on the front lines of multiple emergencies from, from hurricanes to uh, infectious disease, uh, everything from Ebola, Zika, uh, H1N1, and, and obviously the biggest that we've seen in recent memory, COVID-19. Um, and so those 25 years in Texas have taught me quite a bit. And moving from you know, this, this local level to a state level, moving from heat and humidity and hurricanes to you know, where it's wet and mountains up in, in Washington, and also this real political dynamic of a red state so-called to a blue state. And then certainly the, the time that I arrived in the midst of all this was, was right, uh, in fact, the week that I, I began my term uh, in December was the week that vaccines arrived in the state of Washington. So while everybody thinks of Washington as a, a, um, a very, let's say progressive or very blue, you know, I will tell you that if you're familiar with Washington, which I'm learning uh, quite a bit more, that when you think about one of the highest vaccinated counties in the country with Seattle King County, you go right across the mountains into central and eastern Washington, and we are um, facing many of the same issues, honestly, that we were facing in Texas. And uh, it is this real, as Ed said, this culture war, this divide on how people see the world and really what is our contribution to that, whether we bring people together or we further alienate, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have. I, I did want to also make mention that this, what I see from a, from a COVID standpoint, and this applies obviously to, to climate change and or a number of other types of um, emergencies and crises that we face, that we have to really be thinking about whether this is going to be a transactional moment or a transformational moment. Is this a transactional moment where we are one and done, we finished, we completed, we ended a pandemic and we moved on and go to the next shiny object? Or is this a transformational moment where we look at the very things that Anna and Emily and others have described about this real concern about inequities and these long-standing systems that are a certain way? And how do we really approach this from the standpoint of do we take this moment on or we simply let it slip through our fingers just as sand in an hourglass? And that is a real concern for a practitioner like myself, a physician, a medical provider, but also a public health practitioner who has faced all sorts of, as I mentioned, emergencies over the, the decades in Texas, but also very recently the, the storms, but also loss of power in the midst of what happened this past spring in Texas, while my family and friends and I were without power for a period of time, only to see in Washington then triple digit heat and wildfires in the Pacific Northwest also uh, be in a situation that we were having to address. As you know, Governor Inslee in Washington has been a champion of climate change, and that has been over the years. But at the same time, we have to recognize that this is, as Ed said, this culture war is something that we have to really be thinking about in a very robust way. I do believe that partnership is the way forward, whether it's the public health healthcare partnership, whether it's public private partnership, and that in, in the midst of our vaccine efforts, I'll describe in a moment, whether it's the global, federal, state, local community partnership, whether it's 50 states that are com in essence, at times competing with each other when there isn't a national strategy for everything from resources to different interpretations of guidance and the science is a real challenge that we have. And the partnership with the very communities that don't always either understand or if they do, they don't always agree with our role in public health and even the science itself. And we have to be thinking about not just the message, but I agree with the comment about trusted messengers in a multimodal approach that we really need to be thinking about how do we move forward ahead. Washington has been very fortunate. We've worked very hard to champion our three cornerstone values at, for example, our state public health agency, which are equity, equity, 
innovation, and engagement. Equity, innovation, and engagement. And from an equity lens, we have led with equity throughout. No matter who you are, where you live, what you look like, where you're from, you should have access to vaccines in the state of Washington. At the same time, we have very much thought about how do we think about this from a standpoint of investing in the innovation space. When you have the tech sector and this incredible, you know, the power of the private sector in the Pacific Northwest with, with Microsoft, and Amazon and Costco and Starbucks, we brought them all to the table with a VAC center, which is very much about public-private partnership. And so while we have now vaccinated close to 80%, at least one dose of um, eligible population with one dose of vaccine or 70 plus percent with fully vaccinated in the state of Washington, you know, it was really interesting when we were doing mass vaccination sites previously, we went to our Starbucks partners and they said, gosh, if we could get a coffee or a latte in your hands 20% more effectively, efficiently, how can we not help you also get vaccines in the arms of Washingtonians 20 to 30% more efficiently? And that's the power of the public-private partnership in a robust way. The final two points that I would make are really around raising the visibility of public health. And I call this the three V's, that we have had this, as I've testified in Congress, this invisibility crisis in public health well too long. We are far behind the scenes. When we are in front, people don't understand our role, what we bring to the table. And you fight that with what I call the three V's, which is you raise the visibility, when you raise visibility, you have validation where there is this validation of uh, what we are trying to do. And at the end of the day, it is also about working through together with this investment in public health. And so visibility, val validation is also about value. And when you show value, then people want to invest in pro-health resources, pro-health policies. But the biggest challenge that we have is I never thought we were going to have this fourth V of virus. And even earlier in this past year or the last 18 months, we've been seeing violence. These five Vs have been really such an important piece of what we have had to really be focusing on. So there's importance of soft, soft skills with engagement, social media, the culture war. And what I really like to champion is this concern that we have silos of excellence, that we are at the end of the day thinking about all sorts of challenges, but we do it in our own silo. And how do we come forth outside of that? And that's where this final point of investment, investment in public health, whether it's the data systems, including social elements to bring to the health system, disaggregation of data, inclusive of that, but also investing in our workforce, the very behavioral health, the, the, the support when the public health and healthcare workforce have been vilified, especially during this latest Delta surge. We have to be thinking not one in one time, not reactive funding and investment, but smart, strategic, scalable, and sustainable funding that really allows us to be thinking about this from a standpoint of not just like 9-11, not just like Ebola, not just like Zika, that at the end of the day, the funding got to us, but it was well after the fact. We have to build the capacity and capabilities up front in order to be able to be ready for the next crisis or when we layer crises upon each other. Thank you, Alan. That's all I've gotten. Look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thanks to all of you. You've set out a tremendous amount of content. I want to uh, try to pull some threads here together, but I want to begin with what feels like a little bit of a point of tension and maybe bring it to the surface and see if we can do something with it. So Ed, I appreciate the modifier on the critical list of compassion. Um, I think at, a, at an individual transaction level, that seems like a, an, not, I was going to say an obvious, but certainly an important feature. But so much of what I heard from the other speakers were, uh, frankly, an absence of compassion, not in message, but in reality, of inequities and disparities and, and, and uh, uh, practices that, that are really quite actively hostile to people. And then we're supposed to be, comp then 
then we're asking them to do something and you're suggesting we should do it with compassion. So I guess uh, maybe I'm not saying that quite quite right, but I'd, I'd like to sort of go into the question of how much of this is message and how much of this is reality, or to put it differently, can a compassionate message really overcome what seems to be uh, ingrained views based on reality that that doesn't people don't experience as very compassionate? Emily, it looks like you want to jump in here. Well, again, I was going to let Ed talk first, but if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to jump in with this. Um, because I, I think we're, we're talking about two issues that, that need to be teased apart a little bit. Um, and messaging is important, and I, I want to underscore that, that this definitely has a place. But messaging itself is inherently reactive. So there, there's a problem, and you message about it. Um, and, and really, what we're talking about here are some structural issues that are, are more longstanding, that have, have caused, for example, some communities to lack trust in the entire healthcare system. And so what, what needs to be done is we also need to address those systemic issues. And, and this isn't a communication issue. This is working with communities, understanding what's going on, why they feel the way they do, and, and working to address those issues, making, making structural changes, for example, funding public health in an appropriate way that it, it really does serve the, the needs of the community, uh, which, which has not been done for decades in the US. You know, and so we, we need to address those, those structural issues. And, and so there's no way to message around the, the structural issues. Um, that, that isn't compassionate in, in and of itself because the, the issue is still addressed. We have to you know, address those and then also have effective messaging that, that deals with issues as they arise. So I'll jump in next, if you don't mind. Um, I, I think the compassion is really interesting and in that compassion can be both what we say and, and compassion can be at a more deep level what we do, right? So equity-focused policies, equity-focused public health programming and, and healthcare provision is compassionate but it might not feel compassionate to, to some people. Some people might actually perceive that. Some people do perceive that as threatening to them and their identity. Um, and and the, you know, that is a product of the culture wars. As Alan, you said, it's, it's difficult to be compassionate, to remain compassionate um, and kind in the context when the, the public dialogue is becoming increasingly violent. As, as Umer said, and that, that's true. I mean, to me, that's the most painful and awful thing that I've personally witnessed out of the, the, the COVID pandemic, how truly violent and scary this the public response has at times been, not in every community, but in, in some communities, um, to the very people that public polling tell us are the most trusted people in every community in America and every community around the world are health professionals. Health professionals are one of the few classes of professionals that re retain high degrees of public trust. And, and yet we see that, that um, despite that incredible asset, um, it can be quite fragile. Um, so I, I just in one, one last thought, and uh, Emily, I just wanted to build on something you said. I actually feel like, yes, messaging can be reactive, but messaging can also be proactive. I, I feel pretty strongly that messaging is one of our greatest assets. Um, a dear friend of mine, a, a very, very smart communication counselor says that there's, there's really only three rules of, of good public relations. Bear with me a moment. I realize I've just framed myself into the public relations box, but the point is he says the three rules of good public relations are number one, do good things. Number two, be seen doing good things. And number three, don't get number one and number two mixed up. And that's, it's so amazing how often people and organizations get number one and number two mixed up. Um, I don't think that in public health, uh, we often fall into that trap, um, but it coming back to my notion of compassion as being part of, in part what we say, and in, but more fundamentally what we do, um, feel like communica good communication, good messaging about what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the evidence base, did, uh, evidence base for it is, and why we think that's the best thing for all of us. That really is our, our most powerful platform on which to stand. It is a platform that is currently being challenged, sometimes violently, 
There's no denying that, but it is still our most powerful platform. I guess, so, Alan, the only thing I would add is that maybe when you're thinking about uh, compassion, it's that we, we can't automatically uh, catalog people and perspectives in buckets. We have to really be thinking about where people are coming from. And so if there is a distrust of either a message or a messenger or even of science or the root cause, we have to really be thinking about what exactly is, is the reason for that. And when we automatically, and I usually don't use the word compassion in the same sense that Ed does here, but when we automatically decide that we, do, when we automatically dismiss the alternative, uh, that is very dangerous as well. And that is part of where we are is that at the end of the day, when, when you think about it from either whether it's compassion or what I call true engagement, it's really about thinking about where people are coming from and trying to understand that. There is a lot about chaos theory that we also have to be thinking about is that we are in the midst of a global crisis, a severe global crisis, not a crisis like H1N1 was very mild, as we all know. But this is really a crisis that really at the end of the day is very much about people behave certain ways when they are worried, when they're scared, when they don't fully understand all the facts, they're trying to do their best to get that information, or they are targeted, and I use that word deliberatively, they are targeted with misinformation. That becomes a real challenge then for them to be able to turn around and, and, and think about wearing a mask or think about all sorts of other things that are out there that we are asking from a public health practice standpoint. So I think there is a lot in here about compassion, but it's also understanding true engagement and how do we engage people and understand where they're coming from. And, and, and do you want to add, Anna, do you want to add to this? Or I have another question for you, if not this one. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, compassion is important and it has a role to play. I, I mean, I think the big lessons from these two crises are the role of systems and structures and that we need to address that. And addressing that means big changes. <laughs> and, and so it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's it, and that means that we need to address this. And this was the fifth point that I was trying to get to um, at multiple levels, but certainly nationally and globally, because in the absence of a national or global response to both of these challenges, as we've seen, the local efforts can be important, but are insufficient to really move the needle. And I, and I think we have also seen, and this is what COVID has shown us, that in situations of crisis, things can happen that we never thought could happen. So we saw payments to individuals, which reduced poverty by half in this country. We saw uh, the CDC calling for an eviction moratorium. I mean, these are really important things that show how health is connected to other broader social phenomenon. And, you know, we saw emissions drop dramatically when we had the lockdowns. And of course, these are all temporary short-term things. Um, that may not be sustainable for a number of reasons, but they do show that when we have a crisis and we work together, we can do things very differently. And perhaps we can figure out a way to live together differently. And I think this is the big lesson from COVID for climate change. Uh, let me uh, keep going with some additional questions. I think you all have taken the topic of compassion and, and, and looked at it from a number of different dimensions. Um, I note that uh, Anna and Emily, you both brought up the topic of work and the role it plays in people's uh, ability to participate and uh, respond to circumstances. Um, I just wonder if, uh, uh, again, you know, we tend to focus on health policy and maybe this goes to Anna's last point, but um, where, where can we go uh, to try to reduce the role that those kinds of differences play in, uh, in the problems that we're discussing today. Any reactions to that? I'm not sure I totally, could you repeat your question, Alan? Yeah, I'm so, so you mentioned you were the first, I think, to bring in the role of, of the workplace uh, at people's jobs as being a, a key source of inequity. 
And I just wonder, uh, you know, what what the barriers are there and what it might take to overcome some of them. I was just struck that two of you brought that up and here we are focused on on health policy, but it, the fact that it came up twice made me think there's there's more here we should discuss. Yeah, I mean, I was I was referring to the the very important role that work has in shaping people's life circumstances. So I think the pandemic illustrated, for example, how many people do not have sick leave, um, how many people cannot protect themselves at work, or their workplace does not allow them to implement safety precautions. And so I think intervening in the workplace and figuring out what we can do to improve conditions at work is critical to health to COVID and will also interface with climate, I'm sure. But work is structured by the economy. So um, yes, you can do health education and many things, but a lot of the challenges that, that we see have to do with occupational economic structures and the inequities that they create and the kinds of jobs that people have and the flexibility that those jobs give them. And this was you know, dramatically illustrated by the pandemic. So this I'm curious. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Oh, I was just going to ditto Anna's comments that it, it really is when you get into this, there's a, a level of complexity and, and where people work in that in, in the U.S. really an identity for a lot of people is the job that they do. And, and we, we classify people and we think about people in terms of occupation, but it's also a, a point of information, a point of potentially intervention, um, just like schools are for children. And so, you know, it, it's really, I think, using the workplace and, and thinking about this, but really understanding communities and, and what's going on more locally, it, it's both a challenge and an opportunity that we have. It's also a point of risk. And I think that's the other piece that we have to keep in mind in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, while, while many can, can do virtual meetings and, and, you know, do their business in other ways, and there has been some incredible positive aspects of technology in virtual um, uh, advancement that we would not have ever even thought we could do even two years ago. But there are many people that cannot utilize those, the frontline individuals that have to be uh, really in, in positions and situations where they continue to be at risk because they're trying to provide for their families. And that I think is a real challenge as well in the workforce. And yes, I agree in the protections we also have to be thinking about how the risk is there and that you have to, in, in essence, accentuate those protections because it's a real concern for all of us. This is an issue I think a lot about, I worry a lot about. Um, I mean, we know that work, good work is a powerful social determinant of health. Um, I, I personally know less about what good, what, the, what are the attributes of good work, but I'm fairly sure part of one of those attributes is meaning, giving people a sense of contributing to their community in a positive way, place, a place in their community that is respected. Uh, I don't know so much about the implications of, I haven't thought through the implications for a better response to COVID, but I, I have thought a lot about the implications for a better response to climate change. And you know, the nature of our economy is changing and it will continue to change, especially to the extent that we take climate change seriously. And when the workforce of the future is given the opportunity to find meaning in, in their contribution, um, I think that they will embrace that opportunity much more passionately than if the, the work they, the, the meaning of that work feels diminished as so much work seems to feel now. I wanna pick up on on a fifth point about the need for national and global action, which I think is undeniable. And yet I also think about, um, Umer, you, you talked about equity and innovation and I think some of the leading policies and action around climate change is actually occurring at the state and local level. Uh, and I, I often scratch my head at that. And I think on a global policy this complex, what difference can one city or one state make? And yet that's how the change occurs. So I wonder if maybe uh, you could talk about the role of state uh, and and local to the extent that was an, I suspect that was less of a discussion in your local role. But what what is the thinking about states taking a lead on a long term global policy problem that 
uh, potentially some of the responses might uh, make you, for example, less economically competitive relative to other states or or sacrifices that the that the elected that, that the that the population that elects your leadership might not uh, might not withstand because they're asking people to sacrifice. I, I'm just curious how that how we how we bring together the the need for national and global with the reality of so much leadership that's state and local. Uh, Alan, that was to me, right? I'd love to start with you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you know, I do think leadership matters, and you know, at the state local level, it, it is really important that you have good leadership that is appropriately focused on not just what is happening today, but is really what is the threat for tomorrow. I think one of the biggest challenges when you look at climate change is that very quickly, I, I remember this on a, uh, hearing this a few years back, and I loved this this concept that we as either Americans or policymakers, we're, we're really good at collecting the dots, but we're not so good at connecting the dots. And so when we have this real, you know, triple digit heat in the Pacific Northwest and wildfires or, you know, and, and, and you know, storms that are, you know, that are, that are going from, from the Gulf Coast all the way up to New York and beyond. And, and then, you, you know, you have power outages. The entire grid is knocked off, again, as, you know, that, that example that I talked about earlier in Texas. When you start thinking about those things and then we are not good to work with our, our very community members to explain how that is all interconnected. And so then, you know, people think that they're just random, you know, emergencies that just sort of happen out of the blue. Well, it just happened to happen and this occurred. And, you know, we didn't know that the ecosystem of even food and, you know, and even vectors are very interconnected to climate. So I think it's really important that it's about leadership but what you're also seeing is that those very leaders in states and localities are actually the ones who are facing what those emergencies, those calamities are that are occurring in their states and localities. And, and they, you know, there is a, an incredible responsibility in, in state and local government to be, we are mindful of having to protect our own, protect our community members, protect, for example, Washingtonians or previously Texans. We are responsible for that in the jurisdictional bounds of what we are we are there for. And so there is an incredible responsibility that goes with that. But it starts with leadership, but it's also recognizing that what's happening tomorrow is not so theoretical because it's actually happening today. And I think that's the biggest challenge is trying to just, so maybe that's one, part of the genesis of why you're seeing state and locals taking leadership when at times the, you know, this real conflict of, of left, right, red, blue, or however you want to characterize it makes it very difficult to have that real collective action at a federal or a national level. Other thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I'd like to add, chime in. Um, I, I had the incredible privilege of having Albert Bandura, psychologist from Stanford on my dissertation committee. He had been my mentor for the remainder of his life. He has unfortunately recently left us, but one of Al's incredible insights into um, why, why we take action under some circumstances and we fail to take action under other circumstances um, has to do with our sense of, of what we can do, what we're capable of. At the individual level, he called it self-efficacy. At the group level, he called it collective efficacy. Uh, the research that I do with Tony Lyserowitz at Yale um, and our team, we, you know, we've studied people's sense of collective efficacy to respond to climate change at their community level, at their state level, and at the, our nation, our national level. And what we see is a real fall off in the sense of collective efficacy that we can, that citizens like us who are similarly concerned can make a difference. So I, I, I for one, understand exactly why we're seeing much more innovation in responding to climate change at the local and state level, because that those actions are happening at a scale that people can relate to. It's much more concrete and they have a greater sense of collective efficacy that those are problems that they, that they have the wherewithal to work together to address. I think, you know, one of the interesting things, one, one interesting parallel between these two crises is, is 
that in COVID, you know, it's pretty obvious that we can certainly do a lot of things locally, but we also need to vaccinate the whole country and indeed the whole world, right? So there's this, with climate, it's the same thing. So we can certainly do things locally, but if we don't deal with global dependence on fossil fuels, automobile transportation, processed foods, we're not going to fix this. This is, this is the big lesson, I think, that we need to figure out how to grapple with these big systemic problems that span the globe. And if we don't figure out how to do that, if we don't figure out how we as scientists and also as citizens can contribute to that, then we are not going to fix this. That's the sad truth from my perspective. Um. So as we're coming to the end here, I want to acknowledge that we're at a National Academy of Medicine meeting and the focus is science. And Anna, you started us off with a number of comments about the role of science. And Emily, you described uh, a project that is a scientific endeavor. The theme of the day has, has included, uh, one of the key themes of the day has been equity. And I wonder if we could, as we're finishing here, take a more pointed look at some of the comments that uh, Anna, you started us off with, the importance of interdisciplinary research, the importance of a diversity of perspectives of different lived experiences, of asking different questions. I feel like those phrases are often spoken. Um, I'm not sure they're always heard. And I think it may be fair to say, I'm not sure they're always even believed. I would love it if, some of you could, to the audience we have gathered here, give some real concrete examples of the value in our ability to tackle complex problems that arises from a more inclusive approach to research. Um, whether it's, as you've noted, different questions asked, different methods used, different experiences brought in, um, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot as we finish here, but I think moving from the general to the specific is very important. And if you have a concrete example of how that change is good for all of us, uh, I think it would be great for people to hear. So I'll jump in if that's okay um, and give one concrete example about um, decisions being made in, in terms of scientific endeavors without having disciplinary representation at the table. Um, when the, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout um, was very beginning, there was a, a government movement to help support vaccine initiatives. And, and the, the name that was chosen for this initiative was Operation Warp Speed. Um, I, I was in another meeting like this where one of the people who came up with that name said, you know, who knew that that wouldn't be go over well with the public? And, and my answer to that was every single social scientist who's ever worked on this issue could have told you immediately that was a terrible idea. People often will talk about it, and this is for all of us who work in vaccination from the social sector, that, you know, one of the main concerns people usually have with vaccines is, is, you know, I'm putting this in my body. And even with vaccines that have taken decades to develop, they're still concerned about this is new, we don't know the long-term side effects. And so instead of Operation Warp Speed, which is a cool technology name, as long as you're a Star Trek fan and not a Star Wars fan, you know, it, it, it still was problematic. And, and a better name would have been, you know, like safe and secure <laughs> or, or something to, to emphasize, you know, that, that we were going to do this safely. And so, you know, bringing other perspectives to the table, it can, can fix even small problems like this. I think, you know, when we get into race, ethnicity, when we get into other types of representation, the, the problems um, can be more subtle. But, but I think it's, it's critical that, that we're really looking and, and thinking about diversity from the get-go and, and making places at the table from the beginning to involve multiple voices and perspectives. Thank you. Alan, Anyone I guess if, if I would just add is that, as I mentioned about the VAC Center, which was this public-private partnership with, you know, these major, major um, private sector partners in, in the state of Washington, while, while that was incredibly gratifying, important, and, and critical to our work, 
complementing that was our vaccine collaboratives that were really very much about what Emily talked about, which is really about stakeholders uh, from the very communities that were disproportionately and have been disproportionately impacted throughout this pandemic, and to have those voices at the table and to really have the equity related conversations and discussions. So I think one of the real challenges that we have is that we we oftentimes put things at tension, right? So you either can uh, vaccinate many and if you know a, nu a number or or fast, or you can do equity. You can't it becomes an either or. And so very quickly, we say we can't do both. And I would argue we can do both. And I think it's a similar thing with science, that with the National Academy of Medicine, one of my challenges over the, the real years that I've worked with, the, actually NASM, the, the entire academies, has been real this, this tension that's been about science and true science with really all those other aspects of how you translate that science to people who are very much at not always with that kind of experience or education, but they have other kinds of experience and education. And how do we work to include them as part of those processes, which sometimes and oftentimes we do not spend enough time doing. So I would just say that we can't, we start with science. It should always be in our back pocket, but we can't end with science. It has to be markedly more than that. And that's what true engagement is about, especially using an equity lens. Yeah, I believe I heard in the prior panel equity as a trade-off against something else, and it made me a little uncomfortable. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, Ama, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are many, many examples in health research where diverse perspectives can contribute to a better formulation of the question and understanding what factors are important to consider. One that comes immediately to mind are questions about health inequities, questions about race differences. What kinds of things should we be thinking about? What about structural racism? What about discrimination? How do we conceptualize and, and document th these things and understand their impacts? I mean, for that, and many, many, not just questions about race differences, but many, many questions in population health benefit from diverse perspectives. Uh, if, if, you know, there are also theoretical arguments. Scott Page, uh, who is a complexity scientist, has a wonderful book where he documents how um, systems with diverse actors are more robust and more often get to solutions than systems that are composed of, that are uh, homogeneous. Um, so, so there are many, many, many examples of that. I just wanted to add one more thing, I think related to something that um, Dr. Shah was saying. Um, you know, I think we also have to remember that, and we've seen this clearly in COVID, that, you know, science can impact action, but there's a lot more out there than science that affects action, right? Ideology, values, political circumstances. And so we're only one piece of the puzzle. We've seen this. I mean, we saw this you know, in the article in the New York Times today about how um, there are laws against certain public health actions, <laughs> which are science-based. So we can't be naive about that. Um, There's a, a profession that is often missing from our interdisciplinary and or transdisciplinary efforts. And I think very much to our detriment. And that profession is people who do conflict analysis and resolution. Um, I, in my own work, I've been blessed to have a, a, con, a very sophisticated uh, conflict analysis and resolution expert on, on a team that, I, uh, that we worked with over the past decade. We worked with the TV weathercaster community for the past decade. 10 years ago, they were on the issue of climate change. They were, believe it or not, much less likely than the American public at large to even accept the realities of human caused climate change, the most fundamental truths we have about climate change in, in the contemporary era. Um, and we engaged with that community. We brought a lot of compassion and kindness to that engagement. And very, very smartly, I think, we brought an expert in conflict analysis and resolution whose, whose practice allowed us to um, identify the nature of the disrespect that was being perceived by members of the community on both sides of the issue and to let the tension out of the room, metaphorically, literally and metaphorically speaking. Um, and by deflating the tension or by, by ramping down the tension between the, 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 the partisans on, on this issue, 
it allowed a much better conversation between the communication practitioners, TV weathercasters, and the scientists, climate scientists, who were identifying the fact that there actually is a reason. Umer, uh, I love what you said about <laughs> we're going to collecting the dots but not connecting the dots. Um, TV weathercasters have a unique opportunity to help Americans and people around the world understand how the dots that they are perceiving are actually re related to a fundamental underlying problem. Um, so okay, I, we're, we're going to... Yeah, just but just one last pitch, bringing conflict analysis and resolution into the science to society uh, enterprise is incredibly helpful. Well, I think that's a good place to bring us together. There are real conflicts. There are also real solutions and uh, an opportunity uh, to move forward. I'm hopeful that as we reconvene over the years under the banner of the National Academies, that uh, some of the lessons that we discussed today will make it easier for us to tackle some of those uh, complex multidimensional problems that there's no doubt we will face in the future. So uh, with thanks uh, to Anna diaz Ru, Emily Brunson, Ed Maybach, and Umer Shah, uh, it's been a great panel and I will turn it now back over to Sue Curry. Thank you all. Actually, Alan, it's me that you're turning over, oh. but thank you for okay. a great job and all the panel three speakers, outstanding remarks. You know, we've learned so much from throughout the day from COVID to climate change and many lessons learned. And certainly we heard about the importance of system, strategy, coordination, but we also heard really importantly that it's about the community, it's about people, about equity and inclusion, respect, as you said. And of course, at the end of the day, so much is depending on leadership as well as citizenship. And in this context, uh, first of all, let me have everyone at this meeting join me in thanking this panel. A round of applause.